All right. Good morning, everybody. So what we need to start to look at today is examples of imperialism, examples of where one of the big industrial powers building a global maritime empire with the excessive excessive is about the, the increased amount of resources at their disposal as a result of industrialization. We're going to look at lots of different examples over the course of the next coming weeks of industrial states going into non-industrialized regions of the world and conquering them. Again, I really, really, really need you from this point forward to understand that the industrial powers who are also going to be building imperialist empires in this time period are going to be the British, the French, the Germans, the United States, and we'll spend a lot of time on the U.S. for the rest of this class, Japan and Russia. And I need you to know this. If you're not one of those states, you're probably getting taken over in this time period. The exception to this rule is going to be Latin America. That's a whole long other story that we're going to get to. But I will go ahead and introduce to you this idea. In period two, the Americas were the colonies, both North and South America. And the rest of the world were not colonies. And in period three, that flips. The Americas win their independence from these global maritime empires. And the rest of the world becomes a colony or falls under their control. So that's a pretty good big picture idea of what's going to be happening in this time period. And again, there will be a couple of exceptions to what I just said, but as a big picture rule of thumb, it's a pretty accurate state. Now, if you will remember, the first country to industrialize was Britain. What goes hand in hand with that is since they were the first country to industrialize, Britain is going to be the first country to have the, ex the excess resources and the extra resources, I should say, to expand their global maritime empire. So let's talk about the British Empire real quick. In period two, the British have a global maritime empire but with the exception of the 13 colonies in canada the british empire was a trade post it was a trade post empire they had trade posts in africa where they're going to actively be trading slaves they had trade posts all over the indian ocean where they the wealth of britain was coming from taking goods from one region of asia or east africa to another place marketplace in the indian ocean they had some islands in the Caribbean, most notably Jamaica. But what they don't control, with the exception of Canada and the 13 colonies, is vast amounts of territory, especially outside of the Americas. Well, that's about to change. They're going to come and conquer huge, huge colonies. They're going to have it control enormous chunks of land all over the world. And again, in many ways, Britain gets the best colonies, the most valuable colonies, because Britain was the first ones to industrialize, and they're the first ones to really aggressively imperialize using the extra resources that industrialization provided them to colonize non-industrialized regions. So today, what we're going to talk about is Britain in South Asia. Now, let's remember something. South Asia means India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, a couple other little states I'm not going to talk about. Okay. But just as a refresher, since we've been, it's been a while since we were on Christmas break, it means South Asia means um, India. 
okay? So make sure that you really actively and aggressively have that idea in your head. Now, Britain was in South Asia in period two, which means Britain had trade posts. Britain had trade post territories in South Asia, and they were using these colonies to trade for cotton textiles. And let's remember this big idea about South Asia. What is the biggest South Asian exports all throughout history? Finished, beautiful, hand-woven cotton textiles. And I need you to get this, the finished product, which was seen as a luxury good that was in high demand all throughout the world and exotic spices. Well, a series of things happens that's going to pave the way for Britain to expand its reach. In period two, I had told you the reason that you don't see Europeans like the Portuguese or the Dutch or the British go into India and conquer huge chunks of land is that in period two, there was a big, strong, powerful, united empire in South Asia, the Mughal. And what did the Mughal have? The Mughal had guns. So a little island nation half a world away did not have the resources to come in and conquer this. They didn't have enough, a big enough army. They didn't have a big enough weapons advantage. And just the distance itself made it would make it impossible to conquer India. Especially while India is one big, strong, powerful, united empire. But by the end of period two, the Mughal Empire was falling apart. And it's important to our story that we're going to look at today that you remember that the Mughal were falling apart because they were fracturing over religious and ethnic differences. For the first part of the Mughal period in period two, the Mughal were ruling as tolerant, inclusive emperors. Middle people like Akbar, if you'll remember him. At the middle part of period two, you start to see a series of rulers try to rule as traditional Muslims, and they stop being inclusive of the Hindu majority in the Sikh minority. And this is going to cause all sorts of internal issues and fighting, and eventually you'll see a series of rebellions, most famously a group of Hindus called the Marathas, which we talked about in period two, are going to try to break away and the empire is falling apart. It's fracturing. There's lots of division between Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs in South Asia by the end of period two. So the fact that there's not a big, strong, powerful, united empire is going to make it vulnerable. Second thing though that's gonna happen is as they're becoming weaker due to internal fighting, Britain is becoming much, much, much stronger. There had been four states in South Asia that had trade posts. Britain, France, Portugal, and the Dutch. Well, the Portugal, Portuguese and the Dutch are in decline. We'll talk about especially Portuguese decline in this, in this class in, later on in this period. But here's the basic idea about Portugal. Every time I've mentioned who are the industrial powers, I never mentioned Portugal and I never mentioned Spain. They're going to be losing global empires in this time period because they can't keep up because they're not industrialized. But that's a story for another day. So the Portuguese are becoming greatly weakened. The Dutch are becoming weakened. And the two big powers in South Asia are going to be the British and the French. They're both going to have trade posts. They're both competing for the trade resources in South Asia with one another. Well, early on in this period, the American Revolution takes place. And remember what I told you about the American Revolution. It was a global conflict. It was not just confined to the 13 colonies. And I need you to remember with this, 
Yes, the British lose in the 13 colonies, but they win everywhere else. There was a series of naval battles fought off the coast of India during the American Revolution. And basically, the British wipe the floor with the French. And they don't completely drive them out of India, but they mostly drive them out of India. So India is becoming weaker due to internal fighting and the collapse of the Mughal. And the British have basically just pushed out of India, their biggest competitor, while at the same time, Britain is becoming industrialized. And now the Brit India has a big target on them. Now, I need to go back and make a statement. When I say the British had trade posts in South Asia, what I really mean is the British East India Trade Company had trade posts. This was the personal property of that company. Now you may ask yourself, why would the British government send a navy to India to fight to keep these trade posts in the British East India Trade Company's hands? Remember, that goes back to period two themes dealing with mercantilism and also the idea of, well, who invested in the British East India Trade Company? It was the elites. It was the powerful. It was the wealthy. It was figures in government. So, they want to keep this open for the British East India Trade Company. Well, as after the American Revolution ends and after much of France, the French trade posts are forced to withdraw, the French are forced to withdraw from any other trade posts, you're going to see the British East India Trade Company expand their reach. Instead of just controlling trade posts, they're going to try to control big areas of land in South Asia. And here's the number one thing you need to know about the British East India Trade Company's conquest of South Asia. They basically do it with native South Asian soldiers, taking advantage of the deep ethnic and religious differences between different South Asian groups the British are able to recruit a native army called the Sepoys. And what they do very intelligently is as they're expanding and as they're using native soldiers, that groups of people in South Asia, regions of South Asia, that join with the British, they're rewarded. They're going to use the existing political systems and existing political leaders to gain control of South Asia. Remember this, anytime the British are fighting a South Asian group in this period, they will always, always, always have South Asian soldiers and South Asian elites backing them. The elites are being rewarded by the British Empire. They're allowed to rule chunks of India in the name of Britain. And the Sepoys are fighting for the British because they're being rewarded. And again, these, these battles, this fighting, why are, why are the South Asians allowing this to happen? There's hundreds of millions of South Asians. There's only like 30 million British at this point. They're not even sending a big army. It's because the ethnic divisions are so bad. They'd rather side with the British, if you're Hindu, than be ruled by another Muslim, like what had happened in the Mughal. And if you're divided, you become easy to conquer. And that is exactly what the British do. They just pick off region after region after region with South Asian support and by not blowing up social systems and not trying to replace things like the caste system. And the other thing the British don't do is uh, they don't try to convert you. This is not about, they're, they're not trying to like force their religion on Hindus and Muslims. They're Protestant. I told you this in period two, the Protestant states, well, sometimes they'll send missionaries. It's not a main goal like it was for the Catholic states to spread religion. The British government and the British East India Trade Company in particular 
does not care about the space spreading of religion. They care about gaining as much access to as much resources as they possibly can. And that's what they're after. The British include existing elites, so include Hindus, Muslims, and Sikh elites in their political system, and they're oftentimes enriched. South Asia, again, because they're divided, they're super easy to conquer. But here's the thing, okay? And this is one of the most important things I'm going to tell you, and you really need to get this. As the British conquer South Asia, they're going to change the economic system of South Asia. Remember, why do you have colonies to enrich you, not to enrich the group of people you're colonizing? And what you're going to see in South Asia is a dangerous step backwards in their economic development. All throughout history, one of the South Asia's biggest exports had been these beautiful finished cotton textiles. Well, now British factories in Britain are mass producing finished textiles using machines and centralized labor under one roof in factories in the factory system. Britain doesn't want India for the cotton textiles they're producing. They want India for the raw cotton. And what's gonna happen is, because of how efficient industrialization is, it's actually cheaper to buy cotton from India, transport it all the way back to Britain, turn it into a finished product in a factory, and then bring it all the way back to South Asia and sell it. If you're South Asian, British cloth is cheaper than the cloth that you and your people are making. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna to contribute to a larger shift globally in where things will be made. In period two, we said things are always been one into. Where have things always been made? South Asia, East Asia, Middle East. Now, they're not exporting a finished product, the cotton textile. Now they're just exporting the cotton itself. And what's happening is who's getting the better into this exchange? South Asia sells their cotton to the British. The British turn it into a finished product and sell it back to South Asia. And the answer is whoever's selling the finished product, and in this case, that's the British, and this is creating a very, very favorable balance of trade for the British and a very unfavorable balance of trade for the South Asians. And this has become a problem. Now, India is no longer exporting a precious luxury good cotton textiles. They're just producing a raw resource cotton that is not nearly as valuable. Now, the most important event in period three in this unit is the Sepoy Rebellion. Now, I should call it the Indian Rebellion of 1857 because that's what College Board calls this. I had never heard it called this before I started teaching this class. I have always, always, always heard this rebellion called the Sepoy Rebellion. Just know they're the same thing. If you're in an essay, you use the you use Sepoy Rebellion instead of the Indian Rebellion of 1857, you are fine. What happens in 1857 is the Sepoys rebel. And I should take a step backward. Some of the Sepoys rebel. Here's the story. So the British East India Trade Company has a large army of Sepoys in India. What are you giving them to help you control South Asia? You're giving them guns. What does a gun need? It needs bullets. Where are the bullets being manufactured? The bullets are being manufactured in Britain itself. So this is an era before the Suez Canal. So you have to get your bullets that are made, being made in British factory to India. You're still having to sail around the tip of South Africa. So this is a voyage of thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. And here's the thing about a metal cartridge. If any seawater gets into it, it'll rust 
and it's no longer good. So the British had to figure out a way to take to get bullet cartridges made in Britain all the way to India without getting any salt water on them. And what the British did was they'd make these little bullet cartridges and they put a number of cartridges in it and they would put them in this little paper brown bag. And what they would do is before they shipped it, they would fill that bag with animal fat. The animal fat that was put into the bag most oftentimes was either beef fat or pork fat. Most of the time it was beef fat. And because you have it stored in this fat, if water got on the bag, you have it, the bullets floating in this gelatinous material, the seawater wouldn't get on the cartridge and it would be fine. Well, the British would take these cartridges to India and they just hand their soldiers these brown paper bags with the cartridges in them for them to just keep in store. Well, if you're a Sepoy soldier and you're either training or you're actually fighting and you have your gun in your hand, what's the easiest way to open this little brown bag? And the answer is your teeth. Just tear a corner, rip that thing off, and now the bag's open and you can load your weapon. Well, in the process of doing that, it wouldn't be uncommon to actually swallow a little bit of that fat. Here's the problem. The Sepoys did not realize that this material was animal fat. Most Sepoys were Hindu. The bullets were stored in beef fat. And now you have Hindus committing the greatest taboo you can do in the faith, which is Hindus are eating beef in a region where cows are sacred. And you also have instances where Muslim sepoys were now um, swallowing pork. When the sepoys found out about this, there's a massive rebellion against the British. They slaughter their white officers and you see you see a fight back. You see a resistance for the first time to the control of the British East India Trade Company. If all of South Asia had united into this movement, the British would have had a very, very, very hard time successfully putting this rebellion down. However, it fails. You'll notice this rebellion lasts less than a year. Why does this rebellion fail? Why does do the, do the boy soldiers who rebel, why don't they successfully um, win their freedom and drive the British out? And the main purpose of this is because most regions of India did not join the support. Movement. Enough of the leadership of the native South Asian leadership and enough of the Sepoys chose not to join the rebellion so that it would ultimately fail. And here's the other problem. Once you declare your rebellion against the British, guess what you're not getting? You're not getting guns, and you're not getting bullets, and you're not getting ammunition. So the Sepoys who stayed loyal to the British had this huge firepower advantage. And in a lot of ways, the Sepoy Rebellion, most of the fighting is South Asian on South Asian. And since the majority, not enough Sepoys joined the movement, it was ultimately due to the fact. Also, the British do send in their army, a well-trained train. It's a small army, but the leadership of this army is going to be very, very successful in putting this rebellion down as well. So it's a combination of all these things. Now, here's what makes the Sepoy Rebellion so incredibly important. It's the dividing point in British history in South Asia. After the Sepoy Rebellion ends, the British East India Trade Company goes to the British government like, hey, thanks guys, you really bailed us out of a tough one, we'll take our colonies back now. And the British government says, no, you've shown that you cannot keep this colony without us. And because of that, 
you're not going to get this colony back. The government is going to take over the running of India. This is going to have cataclysmic consequences for the British East India Trade Company. This was their most valuable territory. And ultimately, as a result of losing this territory, the British East India Trade Company is going to go bankrupt and it's going to collapse. It will not exist much longer. This powerful company that had been around for 200 years goes away. And instead, from this point forward, India will be under the direct control of the British government. And from this point forward, colonization globally with the British is not the byproduct of a, of a private corporation or company. It's going to be part of an official policy of the British government itself. Know that from this point forward for the rest of British history, it's not a colony of a company. It's a colony of a very, very powerful and expansive government. All right. So we will continue to look at, um, at the, the trade, uh, at the continued expansion of industrial powers in the days to come. Hope you guys found this at least a little bit interesting. Y'all have a great day.